Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to Roots and Refuge. I'm not on the farm right now. I'm actually in my office where I can quietly sit down and convey information to you. Isn't that glorious? Uh, today I want to talk to you about a subject I have covered multiple times before, but we're going to cover it every year because the garden is cyclical. Today we're going to talk about planning your fall garden. So this is going to definitely be more of like a classroom style video. So get a notebook, get a pen. This is something you could definitely listen to like a podcast, but you're going to want to come back to uh, writing some things down for your own plan. Now I love the fall garden. Actually, as much as I love the spring and summer garden, I love the fall garden. I think it's a lot easier uh, for many, many people. Being out in the heat is a massive issue and the fall garden obviously alleviates that. But there are some other things like, for instance, a lot of things you grow in the fall garden don't require the constant maintenance that the summer garden things require. Like, I mean, pruning and tying up tomatoes can be extremely time consuming and you don't have to do that with cabbages. There, there's just a lot less hands-on work as well as um, less pest pressure. Whenever you're getting to the end of the summer and into the fall, a lot of the times the life cycles of the insects that really plague the summer garden, they're over. And so you're just not dealing with those things as much. Maya actually prefers the food of the fall garden over the summer garden. I don't think I'm quite on board with that because I love my tomatoes and peppers and nightshades but uh, the fall garden food is exceptionally good we'll get more to that a little later on in the video I I wish that the fall garden was more commonplace um, in the spring gardens are marketed. I mean, you go into like Walmart or any big box store and they've got a garden section, they've got plants, they've got all that stuff. And a lot of times for the fall garden, there's nothing. I mean, you can't even buy a bag of potting soil. The stores are clearing that stuff out because on the whole, mostly people think of gardening as a spring and summer thing. Now, it is true that if you live in an extremely cold place, um, this is probably not going to apply to you. And you'll have to just kind of use I mean, just your own your own sense on that, just knowing where you are. At. Every time I do a video like this, somebody's like, well, I'm in Minnesota, what can I do? I'm like, try to stay alive. I don't know what to tell you. I cannot fathom living in the frigid north. I love that you guys rock that, but I don't know what to do. I live where it's warm and where snakes can kill you and where you sweat buckets every day because I couldn't, I couldn't handle negative 40 degree um, winters. I just can't even fathom it. But uh, there is more possibility for growing than, than many people realize. And so before you just like immediately click off because you're in Minnesota, and I just hate to call out you Minnesotans, you know it's cold where you are. But uh, before you click this off, just hang on because I'm going to give you some kind of broad information and you can look at where you are and, and see if this applies. Also, is it Minnesotans? Minnesota, when, tell me, what are you? <laughs> tell me what you are, <laughs> you cold weather people. The idea of a fall garden is essentially that you are planting more plants later on in the year uh, that are going to come to maturity. They're going to grow through the end of the summer into the fall and even beyond when your first frost comes. So the first thing that you need to know to begin planning your fall garden is when your first frost date is. So uh, Google is your friend here. Just go put this in your internet search bar, whatever one that you use. And you look for first frost date, use your zip code, um, the closest large city to you or the city that you live in, and that's going to come up, your first frost date. And you need to write that down. Uh, for me here in the Midlands of South Carolina, it's like the beginning of November, roughly. This is an estimation. This is not guaranteed. It's just based off past re weather records. And write that down, what your date is. And then go ahead and just save yourself some time counting it off on a calendar and go ahead and put in that search bar in Google how many days until whatever that date is that you got. And write that down. I'm filming this in the middle of July. My first frost date is currently listed as November 11th. Again, that's an estimation. The frost could come a couple weeks before that, a couple weeks after that. And that gives me about 120 days from where I currently am filming. Some of you are like, oh my goodness, that's longer than your entire season. Or I live where snakes can kill you. I have 120 days, you may have 30 days, you may have 80 days, you may have more than 120 days. If you live in an area that does not freeze, you 
probably would have more success growing a lot of the summer garden things through the fall. Like I know a lot of people like down in Florida, for instance, or South Texas, places that get just intensely hot during the summer. A lot of those people grow their tomatoes and their peppers over the winter uh, because your biggest issue is a killing heat rather than a killing frost since you don't have a frost. But once you have your dates, your first frost date and the number of days left you have in what we call your frost free growing season then you can move from there and make your garden plan uh, if you get your seed packages and we'll get to the things that grow well in the fall here in just a moment but uh, whenever you have your seed packages usually they're gonna have something on there called days to maturity and it's kind of confusing I do feel a lot of compassion for people who write seed packages because you've got what like two by three inches or something like that that you have to fill all of this information and try to teach somebody how to garden in you can't like I'm so long-winded this video is probably already several minutes long I haven't even really told you the bulk of the information I could never write seed packages but uh, days to maturity can be a little confusing because there's not really an industry standard for things that are typically started indoors like nightshades uh, when you see days to maturity that is referencing days from when you transplant your start and it's assuming that your start is six weeks or so old and that the days to maturity, if it's 80 days for a big slice or tomato, that's 80 days plus the six weeks of starting it. For things like melons, cucumber, squash that are more commonly direct sown, when you see days to maturity, it's actually referencing from when you put a seed in the ground. And all of this doesn't apply exactly to the letter on a fall garden because in the fall the days are shorter uh, the sun is less intense and especially into the winter whenever the sun is much further away than it is in the summer uh, things are not going to grow as fast as that days to maturity says so do keep that in mind um, I like to just kind of for the sake of healthy expectations I like to assume that in the fall garden and in the beginning of the winter that things are going to take about 20 to 25 percent longer than that days to maturity says and in the like dead of winter i can still grow things in the dead of winter and we'll get to that i pretty much assume that it's going to take two to three times as long as the days to maturity says because the sun is out significantly less multiple the days are hours shorter so there's much hours longer of dark and then also when the sun is shining it's not nearly as intense the uv rating isn't as high because it's winter so you're gonna loosely look at days to maturity but that is not a hard and fast rule you should also know and I'm, I'm just putting all of the things out so we can have healthy expectations these are not negative things it's just things you should understand the fall garden is a little bit of a gamble there is definitely a factor of you don't know what's gonna happen with the weather one year I had a beautiful fall garden. I had all of these plants that I had started. I had moved them out. I had all this kale and cabbages and they had been in my house because we started to see them in the house and we moved them all out. I was so excited. I had all these beds just full of beautiful brassica plants. The first frost of the season, it was 16 degrees Fahrenheit, negative eight Celsius. Um, the, those brassicas didn't stand a chance and I didn't realize it was going to get that cold. It was kind of unforecasted. We knew it was going to be cold, but I, I tried to cover some of them. I didn't have enough stuff to cover all of them. Like, I mean, it was the first frost. Killed absolutely everything. So it's a gamble. That, that's the only time that's ever happened to me. I've successfully grown brassicas over the winter many times, uh, but there is, there is some measure of gamble. I think it's a gamble that's worth it, especially considering a lot of the stuff we are going to start from seeds and that means that the financial investment is a little bit lower and a lot of times we're using the garden spaces we already have prepared and we're just going ahead and replanting them because if you plant it, there's a good chance you'll get food. If you don't plant it at all, there's a guarantee that you won't. So what we call the fall garden is, like I said, it's the end of summer and into fall, autumn, and potentially even into winter. So it's before the first frost date, and then the summer, and then it's also continuing into the frost and the freezing temperatures as long as it hasn't gotten cold enough to kill everything. So there are two kinds of plants that we're going to talk about and incorporate in the fall garden. And there's the frost tender plants. Uh, and this is things that grow really fast that you can do a second planting of. So right now, July and into August, if you have 
55 days left in your growing season you could go put squash seeds in the soil today and as long as your estimated first frost date is accurate you could be harvesting lots of squash before the frost comes and kills those plants but when the frost comes it is going to kill those plants same thing green beans are another really good thing to grow in succession it's really just succession sowing rather than a fall garden but you know it can be really chilly um, it can be very much fall but if it hasn't had a killing frost yet you could still be pulling in squash and green beans and cucumbers these are all things that grow really fast at this point like with me only having I say only that's my own get on to me if I say that uh, with me having a hundred plus days that's not really enough to like go put a winter squash in the ground hey guys I want to break in real quick here from editing um I want to make a quick little clarification and a tidbit because there's a lot of confusion on this particular point. Winter squash is called winter squash because it is squash that is grown throughout the warm weather and it is stored over winter. That's very confusing and a lot of people think that they need to grow winter squash in their fall and winter garden given the name but it's just a storage plant. All squash plants including winter squash which is your pumpkins and your like butternut squashes and spaghetti squashes the things that have the hard rind on this for for the outer winter squash because they're meant for storage frost will kill them and they take a really long time to get to uh, maturity usually something around 120 days or so to get them to where they're harvestable for storage so this is definitely something you grow through the the summer not that you start in the fall and harvest very much it's not enough to go put a tomato seed in the ground and really harvest very much However, I could take cuttings off my tomato plants and I'll put some, I'll put a link, actually let me make a note. I'm really bad about forgetting my links. You can cut the suckers off of your current tomato plants and root them, plant those, and essentially have a second harvest of tomatoes. So that might be like a fall garden thing that you could get more fruit before the frost comes. But I wouldn't start a tomato seed right now and expect a whole lot because again, it's that transplant plus 80 days until I get the harvest. So so this is where knowing when your estimated first frost is and knowing how many days you have left to know how much you can still succession sow. And if you have 60 plus days, you could still put summer squash in the ground. You could do lots of green beans. You can do um, cucumbers. You could still plant sunflowers. And I'm sure there are other things too, but those are some really common ones that I like to plant later to get another harvest. Because for instance, with cucumbers, like right now my cucumbers are coming in really late because I had a late start and they're very bitter and they're not as usable. Whereas if I start some seeds in a couple of weeks and I start harvesting cucumbers in October, they're probably gonna taste a lot better because it's gonna be a lot cooler. And same thing with squash. I deal with really bad squash bugs early on in the year. I've always gotten a better harvest of summer squash into the fall and green beans are grow so fast and are so prolific it is very common for me to have to go harvest five gallon buckets of green beans the day that the, i know the frost is coming because of the forecast uh, because that's something i very very commonly will continue planting up until i know i don't have time to get them to fruition the other kind of plant that you're going to be putting in a fall garden are frost hardy plants. Now these are plants that can survive temperatures below 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. So my list of plants for the fall garden is not exhaustive um, and I've already mentioned them some in this video just talking but I'll go ahead and just list them off so if you want to write them down. Um, of course there's the brassica family. Everything in the brassica family is frost hardy. So that's cauliflower, broccoli, kale, cabbage, uh, kohlrabi, mustard, which includes arugula or rocket as some people call it. Uh, bok choy, pok choy, napa cabbage, spinach, brussels sprouts. Interesting, sweet alyssum is actually in the brassica family. That's something that's a flower. That's a really great thing to go ahead and sow for the fall because those will continue to flower even after it's frosted. If you live in a place like I do where it may freeze at night but it could still very well be like fairly warm during the day the bees are still going to be foraging. I like to have things that are blooming for the bees. Uh, frost hardy flowers, the sweet alyssum uh, but also calendula is frost hardy. That's a great uh, medicinal flower. Again you can have it out for pollinators but you can still harvest that and use it make skin salves and stuff like that. Uh, chamomile is frost hardy as well as of course like pansies and johnny Jones. Those are frost hardy and those are edible. Uh, there's also corn salad 
salad. I think it's called, um, I don't know, there's another word people call it. Mache, it's M-A-C-H-E, I think. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, we call it corn salad. It's just a green that you can grow. Uh, fava beans are frost hardy. And that is something that a lot of times people grow as a cover crop because they are nitrogen fix fixers and they're gonna add nitrogen back in the soil. The Allium family is gonna be frost hardy, which is onions, garlic, and leeks. A lot of places, I mean, here in South Carolina, we plant those things out in like November, October to grow and then harvest the following spring. Uh, so they're, they're going to be okay with a freeze. As long as you get them in the ground before the ground freezes. I mean, you put your stuff in before the winter, even in much colder places than here. Uh, they're very hardy. Lettuces are frost hardy. Now they are tender leaves, um, but you grow those through the winter and especially like baby greens and stuff you have a little bit of cover to cover them you can keep salad greens coming in all winter english peas shelling peas or sugar snap peas you can grow those uh, when it's cold and then of course your root vegetables like radishes beets rutabagas turnips and carrots those are my favorite i love root vegetables and that is the taste of fall and winter for me because you can roast them, you can put them in soups, you can mash them. Um, I love root vegetables. Now one thing that can be grown for a fall crop if you have like 60 to 70 days, if you have any potatoes that have sprouted and you go ahead and get them growing, especially if you have a garden spot that you can put them out that's somewhat shaded, they can struggle if it's really, really hot getting started. Uh, so you have to water them a lot. But if you have something that's relatively shaded or you can put some shade cloth up to get your t potatoes started, uh, you can harvest potatoes there at the end of the season as well. And they, their potatoes are actually a little bit frost hardy. They, they can't do a hard freeze like some of these other things, uh, but with frost, the tops might get a little bit weird, but if they're already producing roots, I mean, you can get tubers from them and have a harvest of potatoes into it getting cooler. I'm probably forgetting something. Um, if you have a favorite thing, please put it in the comments below so people can get a more full experience from this video. These are just the things that I very routinely grow or have grown in my garden for the fall garden. The flavor of all these things gets so much better when it's colder. So root crops actually, what makes them taste really good is when they're storing a lot of sugar in the root. Uh, if you try to grow those things when it's hot outside, and this is the same thing with brassicas, like anything that really thrives in the cold weather, so it typically suffers in really hot weather. Uh, and if you're trying to grow like a cabbage when it's hot outside, it's gonna go straight to seed. It's gonna bolt, which means it's not gonna form a head, which is what you want out of a cabbage. It's gonna form a main stalk, put on flowers and make seeds. Uh, so you don't get any food out of that. With root crops, a lot of times they, they'll go to seed and not uh, develop a root. Or sometimes they'll develop a root that just tastes really bad. The reason why is because in the summer, that root is gonna be really, really starchy because the plant is putting its energy into develop leaves because it's just trying to go to seed. In the winter, it's trying to survive through the winter, so it's putting all its energy into the root, developing sugars. And so you get much better flavored stuff if you grow it during the appropriate time of year. The other thing I really like about growing root crops through the fall, it's the only time I really do grow them much at all to speak of, but is that you can largely leave them in the ground, uh, especially if it is like pretty chilly, but not like crazy cold and I'll get to what I mean by that in a moment. I'm gonna move this a little bit, the sun's going down. They store well in the ground and a lot of times even if you do get a pretty hard freeze, that is gonna knock the tops back but the root is still fine in the ground. You just go out and harvest it. I typically plant all my root crops and then just harvest them as I use them through the majority of the winter and just treat the soil as my root cellar, which is great. Uh, the thing is with any of these things, you want to get them planted early enough that they can get into a good groove and really get some development before the daylight hours go down. And that's why we're talking about this right now because planning ahead is really important. You can't wait till October and then be like, oh, I need to get some seeds to grow a fall garden. It's too late at that point. Because people are from all over, I feel like I need to talk about what I mean by like, really cold, still warm. I'm using these vague terms as a South Carolinian that we might not be communicating the same thing. Um, a killing freeze is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius. This is the temperature that is going to kill all frost tender plants. It's freezing. 
same temperature it freezes water. The reason why that temperature kills frost tender plants is because it actually freezes their cellular walls. It freezes them and it makes all their cellular, cellular walls burst, kind of like a soda can in a freezer. And then they turn to mush. Frost hardy plants don't burst when they freeze, so they can live past that. What is typically considered a hard freeze is 28 degrees Fahrenheit, negative two Celsius. That's still not that cold. And, and any frost hardy plant can live colder than a hard freeze. People will say out of caution to expect them to die at 28 degrees Fahrenheit or negative two Celsius, but that's not actually accurate. Acclimation really matters. And so if you are going to start your seeds indoors and move your plants out, you really want to aim to be planting them out like four to six weeks before your first killing frost. Uh, because the idea is, is that it's going to be getting colder and colder each night and then eventually freeze it. And then these plants are gonna have an opportunity to build some sort of acclimation. The reason why that one year that we had the very hard freeze at 16 degrees uh, Fahrenheit killed everything because I hadn't moved it out in time. I had just put everything out and it just didn't have the chance. And then also it hadn't been getting cold. It had been relatively warm and then it was like, bam, super cold. Since then I have had, I've had kale plants and collards um, and multiple different things survive 16 degrees. They can, especially with a little bit of insulation. Yo, this is my first video to shoot in my office and um, I'm gonna have to get used to like city sounds. It is so foreign to me <laughs> to hear like sirens going by and stuff. It's fine, we're just gonna keep moving forward. Uh, things can survive a colder temperature, especially if they have had an opportunity to get used to that, or you can always bring in some measures to protect them and I'll cover that more here in a minute. If it's warmer than, let's say like 20 to 22 degrees Fahrenheit and let's say like negative six-ish, seven Celsius, negative seven Celsius. If it's warmer than that and your plants have been acclimated, they'll probably live. They might get a little bit of frost damage, but they could probably live in temperatures that cold. That's what I mean by saying fairly cold. Um, that's why I was saying if it's like negative 40, I, I don't know what to tell you. Now they can actually survive even colder temperatures than that. I'm just comfortable telling you, you can expect them to make it through if they're acclimated. Um, and then if you bring in season extension into this with very, very mild efforts on your behalf, you can help your plants through colder nights than that. And for many people, it's not it's not colder than that every night. You might just have an occasional few nights that it gets colder than let's say 20 Fahrenheit. You can get some frost fabric and go put them over your plants, go out there in the evening, cover them. Um, and then if you live in a place that it's consistently colder than that, I would look into doing some like low tunnel covers. I've done um, a video in the past sharing about how to grow salad greens in a soil bag with an overturned uh, clear plastic like Rubbermaid tote over the top of it to make a makeshift greenhouse. You can totally take a tote like that, just put it over your garden, your garden bed in the ground in a raised bed, pots, whatever. I've had reports from people that have done the salad greens thing I mean, I've, I've had pictures from people showing me kale in a, in a situation like that in this much snow and they said, you know, it's three degrees Fahrenheit in Michigan and these are fine. So they can survive more extreme temperatures, especially if you're gonna give them some protection. Now the trick is for your fall garden is that right now when it's time to think about this, it's extremely hot outside. It's say here in South Carolina, it's over 100 degrees um, Fahrenheit, 38 Celsius. It's very warm. All of these cold weather things, they don't like growing when it's that warm. So you really, to have a lot of success growing a fall garden from seed, a lot of things need to be started indoors. You can potentially start things on like a back porch as long as they're getting enough light that they're not getting really stretchy. Just doing them in shade can be enough. Uh, the problem is, is when you're starting them outdoors in the middle of the summer, you have the full pest pressure coming on your plant. So it really is best if you can start the seeds indoors. Oh, hey, editing Jess here again to add a note that I didn't uh, remember. So I talked about needing to start the fall garden from seed. I do think it's the best way, especially for the fact that there is a little bit of a risk factor in a fall garden because you don't know what the 
the weather is going to do. I like to keep the cost of input down. However, some places will get fall garden plant starts. Not nearly as common as the spring garden. I have seen before where people had root vegetables started. I think that is a terrible deal economically because, you know, a six pack will be six dollars and each plant is one beet. It's one root and that makes zero financial sense. However, uh, you can a lot of times find the brassicas and, you know, things like chard and lettuces and stuff like that started. I find that local nurseries are more likely to have fall vegetable starts. And a lot of times you have to call repeatedly to figure out when they're gonna come in because they usually do not get them in until roughly like four to six weeks before that first frost date. And I've also found that what they get in, they sell and then they don't get more. Because it is, there's a gamble. There's a, there's a little bit of a thing. They, if they get them in too early, they're just gonna go straight to seed. They won't be able to sell them. So I would call around to local nurseries and ask, do you carry fall plant starts if you're planning on buying starts instead of buying from seed? But again, I really want to encourage you to be willing to try starting these from seeds. Even if you start them on a windowsill, get a grow light, uh, start them inside your house where it is cooler because that's where you're really going to get the saving. Because if you buy plants, definitely buy six packs. Um, Local nurseries a lot of times will have lower prices. Do not go buy one plant start of a cabbage for $6. You could just buy, go buy a cabbage for cheaper. Um, that, that just doesn't make any sense. So start from seed is definitely kind of the plan on the fall garden, but if you do end up wanting to buy plant starts, local nurseries are where it's at. All right, back to what I already recorded. So for your brassicas, you wanna start those about six weeks before you plan on moving them out and planting them out. You want to plant them out at least a few weeks before that first frost date. I really like to aim for four weeks before uh, to be able to get those plants out so they can really get some growth before it does get cold because when it gets colder and when the days get shorter, it's all gonna go slower. And we want it, them to get acclimated, we want them to get well transplanted before then. Um, you kinda have to really keep an eye on your forecast. So all of these things that we're talking about growing, the brassicas, the peas, the root vegetables, uh, they really do not like to be over like 85 Fahrenheit or like 27 Celsius, 28 Celsius. That's when they're really gonna start to struggle. So it is kind of a balancing act. Like for people who've lived in the same place and gardened in the same place for a long time, you kind of know what to expect from each month. But the f truth is, I mean like, we probably don't pay that close attention to the highs and the lows and the weather patterns before we were gardening, unless you, have, you do like outside work or something like that. If you don't know what the average high and low is where you live in the months leading up to your first frost, just look it up. You can Google average highs and lows in your zip code for October and see on historical weather records what is average. And then you can know, okay, it looks like on average in September where I live, it doesn't usually exceed 80-ish degrees. So I could plant my brassicas out in September and then back up six weeks from that and start the seeds indoors. So that's how you're gonna do that. Now with root vegetables, you have some options. I typically start my brassicas indoors and then I direct sow my sweet peas and my root vegetables and I usually aim to do that a about four to five weeks before my last frost date. Uh, sometimes I'll go as many as six to eight, but I keep a close eye in case I need to re-sow because I have poor germination. Um, so a lot of times I'll put sweet peas out, let's say if I'm gonna have frost in the beginning of November, I'll plant those September. But I do watch closely because it can still be very hot here in September and I might not get as good germination and I wanna make sure I go in and fill in those spaces. Kind of the same thing with root vegetables. You can start root vegetables from seed indoors. Um, it's piddly because, I mean, one, one beet seed, that's one beet. So you start a tray, you've got 32 beets, you've spent all the time filling up all of those things. Charles Dowding has a method called multi-sowing, I think is what he calls it, and it's essentially where he puts like three seeds in one cup of like beets, and he lets them all grow up, and he plants them out all together. And he'll have a cluster of three beets growing really closely together. They don't get as big that way in my experience, but sometimes we don't want them to. So that's one thing to consider. You could start your, your root vegetables 
vegetables indoors. The one I have found that is an exception to that is carrots. Really don't like to be transplanted. The other roots abide it. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll manage. Uh, you do want to make sure that like when you're transplanting root vegetables that you're getting a lot of soil and trying not to disturb the roots. But carrots can be pretty finicky. The way I like to plant carrots, fall is really the best time for growing carrots where I am because if you try to grow them in the spring, by the time it's time to harvest them, a lot of times it's very warm and they don't taste as good. In the fall, they're so sweet. So I will sow those and put a board over them and I've got information about that too. I'll put it on my notes so I remember to link it. And you put the board over them and that helps the soil stay cool because carrots don't like to germinate whenever it's hot and covering the soil helps. And I think you could potentially do that on other root vegetables but you would just have to be extremely observant and check on them daily because a lot of other root vegetables sprout super fast. So you would want to make sure you didn't leave them under the board. To die. So one of the things that's also kind of beneficial about the fall garden, and say this ahead of time, seed companies are required to package their seeds for that year. So right now seed companies are selling 2023 seeds and towards the end of the year they'll want to start closing those out like after the main part of the season and by like October, November, they'll be launching the new year of seeds. So they'll be starting to sell the seeds that they've harvested this year to sell next year. They'll, they'll say packed for 2024. So one tip that I always do is like when I'm seed shopping in January for the spring and summer garden, I very rarely buy the cool weather crop stuff there. I try to stay a little ahead of it because like right now is when seed companies are going to start marking their seeds down. I like to get seeds. Uh, Botanical Interests is a really good one. In My Gardener is another really good one. I know uh, Hudson Valley often has sales towards the end of the season where they'll start marking things down that were packed for last year and that's a great way to get your seeds for the fall garden. Buy them now whenever you can get them on sale. Um, I'll put seed company links down below as well. And if by chance you have not started from seed before, I'll, I'll link, <laughs> I'll link something for that too. I'm going to give you guys lots of information, but I have thoroughly covered this in the past, but I just wanted to touch on it again now to encourage you to start thinking about the fall garden. There's so much food that you can grow. It really is easier to grow. Um, and though right now, many of us are really burnt out. I'm dealing with burnout this week. It's been really hot and very just an overwhelming little season as far as the gardening goes and that's normal to get to that point when the weeds are going crazy the harvest is overwhelming the insects are mind-boggling there's so many of them you don't really want to think about like gardening for more months at this point but fall you will feel different and it will go ahead start the seeds you can get them out and then truly it is much more hands-off gardening if you have any further questions about this that you'd like me to cover in upcoming videos please feel free to ask them uh, in the comment section because i would love to be able to teach about these things if i know what you need to know then i'm glad to help you thank you for hanging out with me today i hope that this is helpful and i hope that it got your wheels turning i look forward to growing with you this fall i bless you guys until next time